everybody. In times of pandemic, the Museum of Tomorrow is doing its part to keep us all healthy. Our knowledge first pushes us forward by sharing new experiences and ideas on our social media channels. We have prepared special content so that everyone can have access to science, culture, and education from the comfort of their home. With that, welcome to the Museum of Tomorrow. I'm Leonardo Menezes, content manager of the museum, and I will be joining you on this Friday, along with our sign language interpreters, Stephanie and Igor, for another edition of Tomorrow's Here and Now. I am a white man uh, in their 40, mid 40s. I have a white beard and I'm wearing a blue polo t-shirt. Today, we'll be chatting with astrophysicists Neil deGrasse Tyson, one of the world's greatest science communicators. In his best-selling book, Letters from an Astrophysicist, Tyson wrote a letter especially to his Brazilian audience, celebrating the triumphs of Brazilian science and highlighting the importance of investments in scientific production and innovation. Thank you, Mr. Tyson, for accepting our invitation. Would you be so kind as to introduce yourself? to our audience. Yeah, I'll be happy to, thank you. Um, an honor to be your guest. And uh, first watching that two minutes of video of the museum, uh, that is the future. <laughs> if we <laughs> all imagine the future, that's what we want the future to look like everywhere. Uh, I am uh, an astrophysicist uh, trained in, um, uh, I have a PhD in astrophysics. I'm a, a six feet two inches but that's american unit you know united states units i uh, have to convert give me a few minutes to convert and i'll do that uh, but i'm seated so most people are the same height when they're seated check it out it's an interesting fact um i'm a little bit heavier than i was when i was uh in school um i have i still have most of my hair I, i'm 62. Um, i have graying hair on my temples i have a mustache that I've never shaved in my entire life. Uh, it has always been there. I'm wearing a black button-up shirt and I'm delighted to be participating in this event. Oh, uh, and my skin color, I thought about that. It's it's a two-thirds Brazilian coffee mixed with one-third cream. You mix that together, that gets to about my skin color, if you wonder. <laughs> great, great, thank you very much. So let me just share a, bit, a little bit of information for our audience. Uh, to get to know you better. Uh, we know we have some fans here accompanying uh, our conversation. 
For decades, Tyson plays a major role in helping people understand the science uh, that we all have in our present in our daily lives. Through his publications, books, and television shows, we are able to understand complex topics about the universe, bringing us closer than ever before to scientists and specialist findings. By sharing scientific knowledge in an accessible way, Tyson has helped people discuss the science present in our everyday lives and take notice of the connection between events in the past, present, and especially about the possible impacts of our future. In, the, in this event, we will hear from Neil deGrasse Tyson on various topics, and we would also love for you to hear you at home to participate in Tomorrow's Here and Now by the Museum of Tomorrow. Those of you watching can send in questions and comments through the chat box. Along our conversation, we will select some of the questions and comments for him to answer. Please use the hashtag Museu in Casa to participate. So Mr. Tyson, let's begin our conversation. I would like to ask you, from all your books to being a TV show host, your experience as a science communicator explaining complex concepts in an accessible way is a task that we believe in the museum is perhaps as important as producing science in labs, universities, science centers, and out in the fields. However, we also live in times marked by science denial and fake, fake news spreading. What are the main challenges of being a science communicator nowadays? How can we also educate people to value critical thinking over simply labeling facts as true or false? How much time do you have for me to you answer? Have an hour, an hour and a half <laughs> of several questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one question for the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, a few things. First, um, when I was asked if I would write a letter, especially to Brazilian people, uh, instead of writing that opening letter to Brazilian people, I said, uh, I don't. I don't want to claim to know anyone individually because I don't. So let me not write it to any individual, not to your leaders or to your teachers. Let me just write it to your country. <laughs> okay. So it's a letter to Brazil. And I felt comfortable doing that because I'm talking to your the the natural resources, the history, the culture, the and that applies to everybody. It's not just one group of people relative to another. And so my hope is that those messages can be embraced by everybody in the country without anyone saying, well, he's talking to these people, but I'm different. See, that's uh, the moment people start dividing that way, the, the, you begin to fail as an educator or as a communicator. So what I try to do because your question had seven questions within it. First, <laughs> what, I, what I'll try to do is know how is the other person thinking? What is going on in their head? How is their brain wired for thought? And I do some homework on that. I say, where are you from? What are you exposed to? What's your education? What do you, what do you care, care about? Once I know that, then when I bring uh, a story or information or, or enlightenment, I can find out where your receptors are for this information. And if I succeed, then I know I'm communicating with you. If I don't care about those receptors, or I require that you meet me here, rather than me meeting you halfway, or even meeting you in your living room, if I require that you come to me, that's like just lecturing. Yeah. We, we've all seen teachers, some teachers, face the board and just write on the board. They don't look back at you. They don't know if you're awake or asleep. To me, that's lecturing. So I invest a big part of my life, my energy, my thoughts, trying to understand what is influencing you. And that can improve the chances of me communicating. A big part of that, a big part of that is for me, knowing what's going on in pop culture. 
What is pop culture? It's something that everybody knows. That's why it's called pop culture. Is there the latest dance, the latest food that people are eating, the latest television program, a movie? What is everybody talking about? I don't have to train you to be fluent in pop culture. You get that for free. Now, when I know pop culture, that's kind of, I think of Batman uh, on the Batman's utility belt. I think, okay, I want to teach you about black holes or the universe or science literacy. And there was a scene in a movie about that. And I know a lot of people saw the movie because I saw how well it did in your country. So I'll say, do you remember when this character said that to that person? Yes, I remember that. Well, it's like that. And so now I have ways for people to plug in to what I say next. So I spent a lot of time and energy, maybe too much time and energy, being familiar with pop culture so that I can help bring you into that conversation um, uh, in ways that, doesn't that don't require that you sit down and listen to a whole lesson plan. We are participants in that exchange of information. So now, how do you decide what's true and what isn't? Here's a problem. Okay, I don't know specifically the education system in Brazil, so I will, for the moment, criticize what we do in the United States. Sure. So often in the classroom, we think of students as sort of open vessels, open containers, right? So they're, they're there, they're open. And now I, I pour information into that vessel. Okay, what is the DNA molecule? How do what is an engine or how does what are the, the 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 parts of a flower? Okay, this is science information that's sort of loading up, and then I test you on that. Do you remember it? Maybe you'll get a good grade, all right, and then you get whatever is your grade. Then you move on to your history class or your other classes, and then it's just information here. Well, no, that, that, yes, information is a part of science, but it's not what distinguishes science from everything else we have ever done as human beings in the history of civilization. What distinguishes science is it is a way of probing the natural world and establishing what is or is not true about that natural world, regardless of what you want to sure. be true or not true in that natural world. I'll say it more simply. The scientific method is an exquisitely conceived um, approach to knowing where your only task is to make sure that you don't end up believing something is true when it isn't or believing something isn't true when it is. Do whatever it takes to accomplish those goals and you are a scientist. But what we have now are people who think science is just another way of knowing. I can let me know just by dreaming about it. Well, let me know just by talking to people in this cult, or they know things, don't they? Okay, now if it's just another way of knowing to you, then you'll just weigh, okay? Um, I have a lot of investments in these oil companies, and but this person is telling me that I'm warming the earth by burning oil. I want to believe the oil because I have investments in there and you discard this whole understanding of the world and then your urges take you to what you want to believe. This could be political, cultural, economic, religious. It could be any force out there that you want to be true and you're guided there. If you don't know science operates differently, you will just as easily discard the science in favor of your wishes. So what has to change in the classroom 
And it looks like this Museum of Tomorrow from these beautiful images that you just shared is that you become immersed in discovery and your, your own curiosity leads you. Is that true? Let me find out. Mm -hmm. Don't just believe it because somebody told you. Mm -hmm. Ask questions. Probe it. Explore it. And that hardly ever happens in the science classroom. The power so my, of wish, my wish for the world and the future is science is taught as a way to ask and answer questions that you have posed. Not simply as uh, you're just a vessel to receive information. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I talked too long there. Sorry. No, no, no. Uh, th 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 we are here in the show to hear you and to hear okay. your thoughts uh, as well. But you, you mentioned a good point. We are at the museum. We think that the way it's a, a, another way for you to grasp science in a way is for you to immerse you in an experience where not, you not only learn about science when you read something or when someone talks to you about science, you were there and you were not in your home. You were experiencing and you're smelling and you're feeling and you're all immersed in an environment that can make you ask questions. And, and we think that questions are even more powerful than answers in that way. Because the way that a questions makes you rethink some maybe your lifestyle or maybe something that you're curious about, it might lead you to other questions. And those other questions, you know, might be something innovative, might be something that our audience uh, can somewhat participate in the science production uh, method in a way. But at, if you want to say something. Yeah, so what you're describing is what every child does every day of their lives. They wake up, what is this? You know, I'm here on a, on a, on a call with you. Uh, what is this? Can I poke this? Can, what, can, can I? And so <laughs> anyone who has been around children or has had children, they're just these question machines coming at you all the time because they've never seen it before. They've never experienced it before. Every day is a new vista onto life and the world around them. That is a curiosity that I just want to capture in a bottle. And then when you're an old adult who's lost interest in that, just drink some of that childhood curiosity. And then and it, and it, and if, if there were flames within you that had gone, gone to em embers, they now get reignited. And then, yeah. then the world becomes a place for you to learn again and not to just take something for granted simply because someone says so. Yes, and also to have a wondrous look about the world. You know, whenever you look upon the stars or whenever you're looking at the smallest insect, to have that wondrous look of curiosity that might ignite you, it doesn't matter your age. But and I will yeah. tell you something. I've, uh, I've, uh, it's funny that you, said, you described the immersive experiences at your museum. Uh, I can tell you in advance what exhibit people remember most from the museums they have visited in the United States. And I'll give you an example. We have in San Francisco, something called the Exploratorium. It's a huge museum with countless exhibits that you walk up to, they're buttons and levers and, and they're, they're, they're immersive, you're in it. And then there's another one, it's, I, I can't, it's like an arcade of science exhibits. But I can go up to that person and I say, I know what exhibit you remember the most. How could you know that? I know. And I'll tell you what it is. I don't know if it's still there, but it was there when I visited. They have a floor to ceiling sized generated tornado from smoke. And you can watch the tornado form and it goes up and you can change the wind patterns of it. And I said, is that the one you remember the most? They said, how did you know? I know because it was an exhibit bigger than you are. <laughs> uh -huh. You got immersed in the exhibit. The, the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, another great science institute, it's been around forever. I said, I know what exhibit you remember. But how do you know that? It is the living heart. You walk into a room and you feed the... There is the, 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 the speakers give you the sound of the heart and you move like blood through the ventricles. You, the heart was bigger than you and you were immersed in it and that's what you remember. My memory was in Boston, 
the Boston Museum of Science. Full museum of exhibits, there's one I remember most. And it was a room-sized Van de Graaff generator where it generates electricity and sparks go across, but they're big sparks. I've seen okay. little ones of these. I've seen ones on tabletops in the physics lab. Have I seen one that's five stories tall with the cages? <laughs> Like, <laughs> <laughs> and then he had everyone in the audience hold hands, and then he tapped one person, and we all felt the shock. I remember that. So this is science bigger than yourself, immersed, occupying all of your senses. Like you said, the smell, the sight, the hear, the feel it. You and so if you can do that. Uh, you know, the, the the world of tomorrow will happen tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you won't have to yeah. wait for tomorrow to come. Yeah, sure. And uh, it's funny enough that you're describing things that normally uh, we identify as childs, uh, feeling that, and we see that experience. And uh, at the same time, we can also uh, experience that it doesn't matter our age. But let's talk a little bit about uh, supposedly grown ups, but grown ups that have the effect on large, large populations, such as political leaders. Now, in times of pandemic, more and we more and more we see political leaders influencing their citizens, uh, sometimes to not believe in scientifically proven information, uh, and we believe there are risks of this phenomenon to poses to democracy and sometimes to a nation's development. Uh, how can we promote science uh, taking a central role in government decision making in a post-pandemic world, or as uh, Electra, Electra Conteudo here from Débora Garcia, she asked, uh, what are we doing wrong to make people doubt the facts and scientific evidence? Yeah, so very um, hopeful thinking of you to say in a post-pandemic world, <laughs> in this moment, we're, we're, it is a pandemic world, okay? Yeah, and we're going to live I, in it for a while. I <laughs> like the hope that you express here, so I don't want to keep the hope going. Uh, so, um, I can't speak for dictatorships because I don't know and really understand them very well. But I think I do understand democracies and, and republics where there's representative government. So, there's an urge where if the leader doesn't do something you like, you just want to, you know, you beat him on the head and say, oh, you're terrible, you're this, this. and. I think to myself, I, I suppose you could do that, but um, wasn't the leader elected into office? So why are you complaining about the leader? You should turn around, okay? Who, who voted for the leader? Right? In a democracy, it's really not about the leaders, really, is it? It's about the voters. So as an educator, I don't talk about leaders unless I'm just having fun. I don't, I, don't, I don't even criticize leaders. Look at my entire social media stream that I've been, I have had it for 10 years. There is not a sink, and it's all about science and having fun and discovery. I don't criticize leaders ever. I turn around and say, here's an electorate who thinks who thinks humans are not warming the planet, who thinks humans are not introducing a wave of extinction in the tree of life by our own actions. Here are people who either don't know it or they know it and don't care or think it's not true. So that's when my energy for teaching goes into high gear. And I ask, why do they think this way? What are they reading? What what are the, what are their what is their ability to decode what is true and what is not? And when I approach it in that way, I find that there are people who say, "I didn't know that. I never compared it that way." Um, <clears throat> again, my my analogies are more uh, USA centric than uh, Brazilian centric, but people wonder about the future if we keep warming the Earth. Uh, the, one of the first visible things to happen is that the ice that is sitting in glaciers on land in Antarctica and in Greenland, okay, these are the two largest ice sheets 
in the world that are not floating in the ocean. You can go to where Santa Claus is and there are ice, the, the, the North Pole is an ocean, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's no land there. Mm -hmm. If you ever see someone draw Santa Claus and have trees and mountains there, they don't understand what the world looks like. <laughs> if Santa Claus is on the North Pole, he's on a floating sheet of ice, okay? Yeah. So um, th th that ice, it can melt, but it's still the same water level. If you melt water off of land and it pours down into the oceans, the ocean's levels will rise. How much will they rise? You can calculate this. And here's my reference back here in the United States. If we lose those ice sheets, the water level will rise and come up to the left elbow of the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor, where I live. Okay? That's where the water level will be. And all of New York City will be submerged. And so will every other coastal city in the world. The and of that's will be underwater. Most, <laughs> this is kind of most cities here. I mean, uh -huh. why, why are cities on the water's edge? On rivers and on lakes and on, why? Oh, because it enabled, historically, it enabled transportation and commerce and all these, these economic drivers that made the city get formed in the first place. If you melt these ice caps, the cities are gone. Now, now, do you still want to melt the ice? Are you okay with that? Okay, and usually they'll say, no, I'm not okay with that. <laughs> no, I don't want that to happen, usually, when they learn this. So notice I'm not hitting them on the head. I'm not saying you're an idiot for, no, I'm just offering them information so they can arrive at their own conclusion. They, they can take ownership of the conclusions they draw because they understand the forces that lead to that, to that understanding. I will never want someone to say, this is true because Tyson said so. If that's how you think about it, I have failed as an educator. I want you to say, this is true because here's why. This has this effect that does this, that tips that balance. And then you get this result. And I don't need to be in your reference frame when you recall why that's true. Then I know I have succeeded as an educator. Mm -hmm. So yes, I do this. I turn back and I try to reach other audiences who are caught in these information bubbles that modern social media itself is if not creating, it's certainly stoking, okay? Where the only video clips sent to you are the ones that kind of, that you know, that they're in your, your emotional circles. And things that are not are not sent to you because it doesn't work in the advertising model for Facebook and for Google. And so we are living in these, these, these chimneys or stovepipes sometimes called, and you don't even know that there's another stovepipe right next to you. Well, how are they thinking? What are they curious about? And you need to come together and share this knowledge and information armed with inquiry, with the tools, the methods and tools of science or the tools of inquiry. And only then is there a hope that we can come together and establish an objective truth uh, verified by experiments and observations. Then after you have the objective truths on the table, then come around and have your political conversation. Then you can talk about, are you gonna have tariffs? Are you gonna have a carbon tax? Are you gonna fund the transitions, the labor force? Then you can have that, I don't mind politics. Uh, you know, it'd be naive to think that the world can't exist without politics. Of course, there'll be politics. Just don't let the politics pivot on objective falsehoods because that is the first step in the unraveling, unraveling of a democracy. You might as well turn around and walk back into the cave because that's where you're headed. The moment what people want to be true is just simply what agrees with their, their, their politics or anything else that is not anchored in the scientific method. Yeah.
character because also we think that in a way that the, the way that we put future scenarios like high, how the oceans can rise from all those melting ice in Antarctica or Greenland, it poses us a scenario that political issues will also have to face on that. They can deny upon the facts, but at the same time, uh, and we have this challenge in the museum and I think other science centers has, uh, has it too, is not only rational information can change people's lifestyle uh, of not knowing will just make them change uh, whatever they want to choose about what they want to do or they or their the way that they consume goods or whatever. Uh, we have to think how to connect the rational with the emotional in the same way that people can understand and think, mm, I think that that, uh, that future scenario, it might affect my kids or it might affect uh, the kids uh, of my friends or you know, have that narrative that goes into the future and maybe see why is it so important for us to uh, think about the choices that we make today because they construct different future scenarios whenever we choose them. And in this way, I would like to bring up a question from our audience. Vinicius but just real quick, you were, there's an insightful point that you made. Okay. Uh, I want to compliment your point. It was insightful because you are right. There are many people they may they could think rationally, but they act on their emotions, right? Yeah. And we, as humans, are very emotional species. Yeah. And I have deep respect for the ways your emotions might blend with a scientific discovery or an understanding. And I, at all times, try to be sensitive to that. Um, in fact, that's was that's the driving force of the letters in the letters book. These are people who feel things. And, and I don't want to just be a cold scientist. I want to feel things with them so that we can arrive at a solution together. Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, bringing up the question of Vinicius Venn, you were talking about climate change and everything. So Vinicius asked, after the pandemic, what will be the next great challenge for humanity in the field of science? Mm. So for me, um, I think the challenges of science should not be let us try to stop the pandemic. The challenges of science will be, let us make sure we never have a pandemic ever again. Don't wait until you have a problem that, oh, we're the scientists, we need you to help us. Fund science such that you never even need that solution in the first place because the solution is built into the system. You can fund a whole virology institute where they study viruses, whole class. There, some of that is happening, but maybe we'll put a little extra resources there now, given the cost to civilization that the pandemic has wrought upon us. So uh, I want to say here, and I just noticed because I'm there, there are questions that are swimming by here, and there's one that I want to fold into what I just said. By the way, when you're on the frontier of science, sometimes things go wrong. You get the wrong answer. Sometimes uh, the machine breaks. So if you're on the frontier, it's never been done before. So failure on the frontier is a fundamental part of what it is to explore. I had a professor uh, in graduate school, his name was Martin Schwarzschild. He said, the day you stop making mistakes as a research scientist. The day you stop making mistakes is the day you can guarantee you are no longer on the frontier. And that's stuck with me ever since. So the culture, whatever is the culture of success, has to include the value of failure. And you wanna be able to learn from the failure. Okay, so failing and learning from it is more valuable than never having failed in the first place. In, in, from my read of, of history and of discovery. So when you have these institutions, yes, allow failures in there and have people come back and then improve on what broke. Yeah. When you have that, oh my gosh, like I said, you'll make tomorrow happen today. <laughs> <laughs> Great, because we also think that uh, the error is a process, is a big part of the process of discovering things. 
you have to try and you have to try until you know the solution emerges and it emerges because of the effort and the, the effort, effort and the grit to stay yes. with it and by the way grit i don't there's a familiar term it's it's gaining currency uh in english where grit is what is your the strength of your ambition to overcome failure yes that's yes. the that's the best one sentence definition i can give for it and uh, by the way the um again i don't want to confuse failing at something when you should have known better <laughs> from failing at something because no one has ever attempted it yes and it's also imp important to let others know about your failures so that they now know not to duplicate your failure. That's what the world of publication is about, uh, peer-reviewed publications. So if I try something and it fails, I'm going to publish that result. Mm -hmm. I did it this way. Don't do it this way. Here's why. Now, your next experiment doesn't have to worry about this, this, this possibility because I've already checked it for you. And now I can further hone the steps you take next so that you can possibly come to a solution even faster. Yes. So you talk about this process and some here we have questions uh, from Rafael, from uh, Chin Chin Pires. They're all questioning about how we're going to, if by the end of the century or even the next decades, uh, if uh, uh, humanity is going to readapt itself to a warmer planet, or uh, in the meantime, we're going to be able to uh, make space colonization. And the space colonization is a way of us checking out 50 years ago, the first moments that we landed on the moon, and to see the step-by-step -step with all the errors and all the advancements uh, that science has been made possible for us to get to the moon and now even further. So I would like to combine the questions from Rafael and combine the questions from uh, Tim Tim Pires, that in a such vast universe what does it mean for humanity the fact that we are getting closer to being able to inhabit other planets other planets like mars making us the possible first interplanetary species what does it mean for humanity <laughs> okay first if we colonize mars we will not be the first interplanetary species to do so uh, we will be joined by all the bacteria <laughs> that we carry with us <laughs> on our skin and on our gut. Trillions, trillions. Uh, the bacteria was brilliant. It said, I'm going to invade the ones that built spaceships. That, I mean, think about it. The, this is the brilliance of the coronavirus, of COVID-19. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to give symptoms to somebody, to a species who invented airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> there would have been no way the coronavirus could go from China to South America unless it was on an airplane, okay? Planes. <laughs> <laughs> These are brilliant bacteria. I don't think you're at the top of the chain here. Uh, so that's my first comment. Second, uh, to, you began with the question, will we adapt to a warmer Earth? Yeah, if you can take every major city in the world and move it inland 30 kilometers, okay? And the, we have all have new coastlines. All the beaches of Brazil are gone. Uh, if that, if, is that what you mean by adapting? Yeah. I, by the way, global warming will not kill us. It, it won't render us extinct. It will just completely reshape civilization that we took 10,000 years to build. And it'll do it in a matter of decades or centuries. So uh, if, if adapting to that means... We all have less food and we don't live as long and we're not as healthy and we're not as secure and all of our cities are dead, um, but you're still surviving. Okay, yeah, we can adapt to it, I suppose. Um, now, if you mean biologically adapt, be, because a warmer planet is not just, am I a little warmer today? It's all the other consequences. The fact that, uh, uh, that parasites in colder climates, you don't see this much in Brazil, but in colder climates, there are parasites whose populations rise and fall with the seasons. Okay, they'll come, they'll rise up like mosquitoes, for example, in the summer, and then they get tamped down in the winter. The winter kills off many of them. Some go below and survive until the spring. Fine. But suppose your winter is not as severe in, uh, in the future. 
then the population is not tamped down as much. And come spring and summer, you have way more mosquitoes than you did before. We are not the only ones affected by climate change and global warming. The entire tree of life is. And it redraws the balance, uh, the, the lines of demarcation between survival and not, depending on which animals, parasites, um, organisms thrive and which ones do not. So now on another side of that is, do we adapt by modifying our DNA? That's an interesting, we might have that power in the future. Um, we might have to do that if you wanna live on Mars, low atmospheric pressure. There's no oxygen there now, we'd have to bring some with us. So really I'm thinking you wanna become a multi-planet species, Mars would be the planet by far because it's it has seasons by the way its axis is tilted uh and so it has polar ice caps as we still do for now um it rotates once in about 24 hours uh, so mars is kind of interesting target for us but um it's you can't live there you, you would survive a couple of minutes and then you'd suffocate okay so so uh, we would have to terraform Mars, one of my favorite words of the last few decades, terra, Earth, form, to make shape, terraform Mars to turn it into Earth. Then you could ship billions of people to Mars and it'll be the new frontier, And but it'll be like Earth. You know, you put in some rainforests and some, you know, and, and uh, uh, ski slopes if people want to go skiing. You have all the different things we do in the different climates. So I, we'd have to learn how to terraform first before we claim Mars our home. Otherwise, we'll be living in sort of habitat modules, you know, uh, 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 you know, Earth domes. You build a dome and inside the dome, it's just like Earth. Well, if you're going to Mars to live just like Earth in a dome, why not just do that here on Earth and you don't need the dome? That's what I'm just thinking. Way cheaper, way cheaper. <laughs> yeah, get your cousins to send you pictures back from, from Mars. It's way cheaper and way safer, I can tell you that. Uh, so I think it's far in the future that we be, could become a multi-planet species. Long before then, I imagine we just have tourist trips to Mars or to the moon or into orbit or to, to, to um, piggyback a comet or an asteroid for a while and then detach and come back to earth. And that could be what you did on your summer vacation. That could be fun. I would totally sign up for that. After people say, will I ride Elon Musk's rocket to Mars? I get asked that all the time. And you know what my re reply is? I'll say, yes, but only after he sends his mother and brings her back safely, <laughs> 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 then I'll go, okay? <laughs> I'm not going to be your guinea pig on your first rocket, yeah. okay? Yeah. And, and as far as we know, it's only a one-way ticket, right? You know, you get there and farewell. We yeah, have the difference is, the difference, the difference is, is no, people, no say, people say uh, visiting the planets in space, that's like the era of the great explorers of the 15th century, Okay from Spain and Portugal and, and they explore the world and they come and have colonies and they, uh, okay, holding aside the, the, the issues of colonization in yeah. the past of European cultures, hold that aside for the moment. Just consider, okay, that when Columbus came to the new world and stepped off of his ship, he could breathe the air, okay? <laughs> Other humans were there to greet him. If his ship broke, the trees in the new world were also made of wood so he could repair them. Mm -hmm. There is no counterpart to that in space exploration. Mm -hmm. If you land on the moon or Mars and you're the first there, no one is there to greet you. You can't breathe the air. You can't repair your spaceship with circuit boards growing on trees. So they're not equivalent actions. The people who, who try to relate 
that era of exploration to space, it's poetic, but that's where the similarities end. Yeah, that's like a way for you to arrive in the moon or in the Mars, and let's say, um, mm, what's this here for supper? Let's go. <laughs> it's a film. <laughs> So uh, here a question about your educator side. Uh, Ursula Rodriguez is asking about uh, with the hybrid teaching and learning, especially in pandemic time, how would you go about teaching practical lessons using, uh, other than using uh, household utensils? Can online simulation substitute the hands-on experience in your opinion? Yes, and the people who say no in my experience, have not been creative enough to create one of those experiences, all right? They've just given up. They think, oh, I have to just lecture to you, and then that's the immersive experience. Oh, and I have a little demonstration. Oh, it doesn't work. Oh, therefore, you're going to indict the entire medium because you can't figure out how to use it? So I'll give an example. Uh, there's a video that I will soon retweet that I that came across my my social media feed. The video is just brilliant. I, I'm going to do it this weekend. I wasn't ready to do it yet. Just brilliant. Brilliant. It's like, it was one of these, I wish I had thought of that. Because not of how complex it is, but how simple it is. Okay. So here it is. You ready? Um, we talk about the speed of light. It's 300,000 kilometers per second. Okay? We know of nothing that goes faster than light. And I can say, I, I could lecture to you, I can say light takes one and a half seconds to reach the moon. Light takes eight minutes to reach the sun. I, I can tell you this. Light takes four years to reach the nearest star. And rapidly, it just becomes a kind of abstract. All right. This physicist, now based in Japan, I forgot his name, I didn't come prepared with his name, but I will make sure millions of people know his name this coming weekend. Uh, he just has a little picture and he says, here's Earth. And there's Earth, okay? And he says, at the speed of light, Earth goes seven times around the Earth per second. And so there it is. I mean, with minus the noise, okay? <laughs> and you see this sort of beam of light circling the earth seven, because you can see seven times a second. You, you know, your brain, eye can see that. And it's like, wow, oh my gosh. And then the video continues. And it said, light takes 1.4 seconds to get to the moon. And you see earth and the moon, and there's the light taking in real time. Real time, you, you can time this, 1.4 seconds. And so you say to yourself, wow, if I'm on the moon and I wanna talk to someone back on earth, it takes one and a half seconds to get there. Now another one and a half seconds, that's kind of, that's not quick, that's not witty repartee as they say, but I'm feeling this. How long does it take to get to Mars? Oh my gosh, so now he has earth and Mars or the sun and Mars. You just watch the light. And you sit there for 10 minutes, <laughs> and there's the light. And you say, my gosh, in the vastness of space, light looks kind of slow. Yeah. You want to speed yeah. that up, don't you? And he does this for these other objects, and it's the actual amount of time it takes. And I'm thinking, I will never forget what I just saw, ever. And no one is lecturing at me. There's no language barrier. There's none of this. And he's combining the speed of light and distances in the universe to do this. That was brilliant, and that's the kind of module that can be loaded into education platforms that are virtual, as you said, hybrid, whatever the word you chose, to different tools, video tools to come together to make that happen. So I think it's you're only limited by your creativity in this world, in the world of education. And don't tell me, in the same way, don't tell me as a teacher, the kids just don't wanna learn today. I've heard teachers say this. Yeah. You may have heard them, some teachers say that too. 
They just don't want to learn. Excuse me? Maybe, have you considered maybe you're not a good enough teacher to instill upon them the desire to learn? That's part of teaching too, I would think. Yeah, get out of your... Are, are you capable of judging yourself uh -huh. rather than those who you teach? And I'll tell you something else. I've said this before. I'm going to say it here on your show right now. You ready? Bring it on. Students Bring it on. who get straight A's do so not because of good teachers, but in spite of bad teachers. Just pause on that sentence for a moment, okay? That is a logically true statement. So if you have a straight A student in your class, your urge is to say, oh, look at what great, great things I did with that student and look what we did for him. The, excuse me, you may be a brilliant teacher and you can tell yourself they got an A because I'm a brilliant, because you're a brilliant teacher. But how about the crappy teacher? The student got an A in that class too. So here's a really crappy teacher who doesn't have good lesson plans, who's boring. That student got an A in that teacher's class as well. If they could get an A in a crappy teacher's class, you know they're going to get an A in your class. So the real talent here is got nothing to do with any teacher's talent. It has to do with the study habits of the student themselves. They got straight A's not because you're a good teacher, but they got straight A's in spite of bad teachers. So what I'm trying to say here is you want to measure. You didn't ask this question, but I'm here now and I got to say it. You want to know if you're a good teacher? Don't show me your straight A students. No, I don't care about your straight A students because they're getting straight A's with or without you. That's what it means to get straight A's. All right. Show me the student who was thinking of leaving school and you convinced them to stay. Show me the student who was struggling with a low C average. They have letter grades in Brazil. I don't know. A, a low C average. And then you, you, you inspire them and now they have a high B average or maybe even an A. Show me the students you made a difference in their lives for you having been their teacher. Then we can talk about who's a good teacher in this world and who isn't. Until then, I don't need to hear your stories about how many straight A students you taught. I'm sorry, sounds aggressive, and it is, but it's true. And not all truths are pleasant. And some require a mirror. Some require some, some means of saying, wait, am I, am, am, am I doing that as well? And what do I need to do to fix that, adjust it, to make it better? Mm -hmm. And in that way, we also have to ask ourselves how us, and especially in the case of the museum, how us institutions can uh, provide, especially for science teachers, and we do have projects that are focused for science, teacher, science teachers, uh, such as uh, Inspira Ciencia, which is Inspire Science. Uh, and at the same time that we do see the need for investments in science teaching, we have also seen, especially in the last few years, uh, with funding cuts and the, last, and the lack of investments for science production in Brazil, still Brazilian science has played an important role during, especially during the pandemic. For example, a researcher, Jacqueline Go uh, Goiz, we, who we have interviewed here in Tomorrow's Here Now, he, she's a, a black woman researcher from one of Brazil's most poorest region, the Northeast. She has led the first genome sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 virus just 48 hours after the confirmation of the first COVID-19 case in the country. How do you think that Brazilian science can prepare itself to take a major leap towards the future, especially the, about the letter that you have written for the Brazilian audience? in your new book? Yeah, a very important question you ask there, and thank you. And it's uh, great to learn of this uh, this wonderful story of, of, of one of your scientists contributing to our understanding of, oh, you gave it the official SARS-2-COVID, what? Yeah. <laughs> the full, 
<laughs> the full name. Ta, ta, ta. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm still calling it the coronavirus. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so um, the so in my experience, while it may be possible to try to get people interested in science, that may be possible. Um, in my experience, the most potent way to accomplish that is for there to be very visible science happening around you so that people say, wow, how did they do that? I want to do that. We went through just that episode during the Apollo era. Even though we're going to the moon because we're afraid of the Russians, the Soviet Union, there's the, the geopolitics of that. Hold that aside for the moment. We're going to the moon. The moon is, nobody goes to the moon. The moon is, what? That's in space. You don't go to the moon. How, how are you going to do this? Oh my gosh, wait, we just went into orbit. Oh, we're selecting the astronauts. Oh my gosh, there's this huge rocket. Oh, and it's 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 going to happen. Oh my gosh. How did they make that happen? You need engineers. I want to be an engineer. You need scientists. I want to be a scientist. We need astronauts. I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a commander of one of those capsules. Oh my gosh. Do you realize over that period, you didn't have to create programs to get people interested in science? Not in the United States of America, you didn't. People were climbing over each other to do that all by themselves because it was written large in headlines, if not daily, but weekly. And that was the period, I would say, from the mid early to mid-1950s up through the mid-1970s, so to a 56, 20-year period in the United States, we... We're thinking about the future. Our magazines, you, you didn't have to wait more than a month for there to be an article about the city of tomorrow, homes of tomorrow, transportation of tomorrow, food of tomorrow, fashion of tomorrow. Everything was about tomorrow and everybody knew that to make tomorrow come, you had to be fluent in science, technology, engineering, math, you, even if no one told you that, you knew that, okay? You, you knew that. The politicians are not inventing that. The, all these, none of these other professions, they're not, you need the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math. And you knew this without people even telling you this. So that wave of science innovation shaped the world that would follow. Bill Gates and Steve Jobs of Microsoft and of Apple Computer were like 12 and 13 years old when we landed on the moon? You can't, you can't overstate the power that these influences can have on the ambitions of a next generation. So you can say, we, we need more scientists, let's train science teachers. Yeah, you can do that and it might have some effect but if you do something big that has huge, huge consequences on civilization, you won't need the programs because that itself is the program. Now, so if as a country you are cutting away funding for science institutes that do very visible science that help civilization and society and culture, then you're removing the... the I think one of the greatest forces of inspiration that exists in this world to get people thinking about science. And by the way, if the science is running and rolling that way, okay, and then a politician rises up and said, no, I don't want to do the science. No, nah, who cares about science? Do you think that person is going to get elected? <laughs> Again, in a democracy, you know, the, the leaders reflect what, who voted for them. Okay, so maybe not enough people know the value of science investment. Mm -hmm. So that's what your museum is all about. Mm -hmm.
what and it all, means to and be Boston science literate. So, and also your books. That's all we are trying to do well, to get people I, interested. I, in, in those I try, things. but more people will go to your museum than who will ever read my books. <laughs> no, I don't so, know about that. <laughs> so museums are good. You need the museums, yes. There's one thing that I, I uh, from one interview oh, by the way, that one, I, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt, one other thing. Not everybody reads. Some people prefer to watch a documentary. Some people prefer to hear a podcast. So I don't assume that everyone will consume what I create in any one media. So I give this. So I have a textbook. I have popular level books. I have harder books. I have a podcast where I have a comedian as my co-host. So I try to try to be in different media. Mm -hmm. And even if people can't afford the book, okay, apart from libraries, if you can't afford the book, my podcast is free. Yes, you have to listen to a one-minute advertisement in the middle, but it's free. And there's tons of science on that podcast. It's called Star Talk. All right. So so I'm I'm comfortable in my skin knowing that I have given people many different ways of reaching the universe in an attempt to uh, what I, what we try to do is bring the universe down to earth uh, for mm -hmm. all to embrace and uh, uh, and museums and I work at a museum like like you yeah. so yeah, you we know and we sure. see firsthand the value of museums as, as a whole but also the fact that school groups come to the museum I love the statistic in the video of 50,000 school children a year oh my gosh you know, you don't know in 10 years, 20 years, what effect you're going to have. You don't, you, you can't guarantee that, but you know that you will have no effect if they don't come at all. So yeah. that's where the hope sits. Yeah. And uh, connecting that uh, wonderful comments with something that I heard uh, in an interview with you that I saw is that you said that you don't know, of course, about that reality on the countries, but in the U.S., uh, if you pass on the streets, or someone passes on the streets, and see uh, uh, a mother and a child sitting in the streets, in a, in a street situation, living in the streets, uh, and this child is playing chess. Uh, you think that it's uh, almost everyone in the streets, if passes by that situation, will stop and will try to make that child uh, go to a school or to give them a book, to give he, him or she a book. Uh, and you think that that's something that was built up in the American uh, uh, way of living or the way that education plays in America. So I'm going to connect that with a question made by Ricardo Sparta. Uh, how, can, how science can help to break archaic structures such as racism, elitism, inequality, wealth distribution in developing countries such as Brazil. So how do you think we can connect uh, different realities such as this? But man, you, you, you ask some deep questions here. <laughs> I have more for you. <laughs> We're the simple questions. <laughs> but my favorite color is purple, okay? Can I get some of those questions? <laughs> um, all right, so just to bring people in on our conversation that we had offline, um, I was visiting Mexico City for, I, I forgot why, I think it might have been when Cosmos went to, um, to Latin America, the Spanish-speaking Latin America, and I, had to, I saw some homeless people in the street, as we have here in New York City and in most large cities of the United States. And... Uh, it's sad to have people who are homeless and poor, and um, I think that's sad in any context. So the real question is, what is anyone thinking about it, or do they care? And so I posed the question to someone in, in Mexico City, when you see them, what do you do? What are you thinking? They say, well, they're, they're poor and they're homeless, okay? And I'm not. So that's them. And I, me, I have a job and I have a family and I own a home. Okay. So, okay. So I said, suppose you saw a child doing something sort of intellectually engaged, 
like they have a math book, or you know, like a ten-year-old child homeless. They're they're reading a math book, or like you said, playing chess. Would that make any difference to you? And they, and she said, no, they're homeless, and I'm not. And so I had to wrap my head around that because I can say with some confidence that in the United States, if you see homeless people, you might want to ignore them. But if you see a homeless person doing something that is like, whoa, what, what? The kid is playing chess. Let's let's support that. Let's find an opportunity for that. Let's nurture that. I I don't know if I can speak for every American, but I'm telling you, this sentiment it runs deep. You don't want to squander someone's talent in the street simply because they're the homeless class and because in in america forgive me for saying america because all of north and south america is america i know this but it's simpler when i just say americans to reference the united states it's simpler but i know my transgression by doing so i'm self-aware um my point is in the united states however whatever our struggles have been for equality okay whatever they've been and whatever they are deep down in we object to the concept of second class citizen we just object let me tell you how deeply we object object okay by the way we don't mind you being rich Okay, okay, living in the big home and it's a fancy car. car. Okay. Okay. But, but you are only that because you have money. Not because, not because you, you yourself, yourself are, are something special. special. Because, because once I once I, I, once I, once I recognize that one day. Oh. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, please. The mic has started to do some humming. Oh, I'm so, sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. So we should how bad, How bad is, the is the humming? The humming got a little bit loud. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, what I can do is go to the computer's computer is phone. phone. It won't be as bad, but it won't have the hum. Should I? Yeah, should I? yeah, yeah, you should go out, uh, talk a little bit about. We, we have to go back to that question. Meanwhile, you try to. Uh, okay, okay. If I go to the computer, it won't be as good. I might go to the microphone. We can do it. Okay, we can try to do it. Uh, and I'll comment about some of the uh, comments that we are having uh, here, like Paula Camata, she said, what a beautiful uh, talk. Uh, we also have some questions about uh, Cosmos. Okay. Uh, now, the, now the microphone. Okay, so now this is not as quality a microphone, but th maybe there's no buzz? How is it? No buzz. No, but you, okay. now you can continue. Thank you. And I'm sorry, to, this answer is a long answer, but you're asking deep questions. So, mm -hmm. so um, if I don't believe that you are somehow genetically special yeah. and you just happen to have more money than I do, that leaves open the possibility that I can live that way one day because then I have money and then I can buy the house and I can do, so, so, and let me tell you how deeply this runs. In the United States culture, we have first class airline seats, but no second class airline seats, okay? It's not called second class. That's, that's how deep in our culture this is. It's called economy. You are choosing to save money by flying in the inexpensive seats. We do not layer the classes. Whereas in Europe, there's first class, second class, third class. When I first saw this, I don't want to be second class. I don't want to be third class. I don't mind if I'm not first class, because one day I could be first class, but I don't want to ever be second class. This is a mindset in the United States. And it started the day we signed the Declaration of Independence. People forget this, but I have to emphasize it, okay? In the Declaration of Independence, it says, all men are created equal, okay? 
Yes, it omitted women and there's this clause for slaves. Hold that aside for the moment. That sentence was to be read by a king, by King George. If, if a, your colonies band together and say, all men are created equal, and, the, and people later on are going to form their government, it means we don't give a rat's ass about your royalty. Oh my gosh. What did, so it, it throws out the genetics, your genetic line, your pageantry. And so, no, no, we don't, we don't play that here in the United States. So, so when I see a child, I'm not going to say they're just homeless. If there's a spark of something that can enable them to rise up, I'm going to find a teacher, a chess teacher. Um, if they're reading a math book, I'm going to find resources so that that person's talents are not wasted. And I know in the end, we all benefit. Do not tell me that you are of a class of people where you're the only ones who have, should have access to education. We're all human. All of us. Check the DNA if you don't remember this fact. I don't care your skin color. I don't care who, who you know, all these reasons why we tribalize and prevent some people from having access what because their skin color is different like <laughs> have you done a species check lately okay so now you're going to say they we will not allow them to be educated these resources are only going to these people you have shot yourself in the foot the future of your country will ride on the shoulders of access to opportunity for every one of your fellow um, um, uh, citizens of that country. And the moment it's only one class of people who has access, you know, move back to the cave because that's where you're headed. But, and by the way, this was the big problem for most of civilization. Hold aside how white people treated black people, Look how men treated women. Women had no access to educate, very little access to education, opportunity, power, decision making. So what those men decided explicitly and implicitly was that half the popula more than half the population of the world would, would not participate in the discovery of moving civilization forward. Imagine how much earlier we might have walked on the moon if women were engineers a thousand years ago. Just just think think that through. Think that through. We're we're running on half the cylinders of the car. Forgive me, that's a combustion engine reference. We're running on half the battery cells. <laughs> Don't you want to run on all cells? Don't you want everybody to participate? And just a little things. We uh, we did a renovation. Uh, of a part of our apartment, and my chief architect was, was is a woman, and our, the and the, the architects tasked to it were women. I'm in a museum where the head of the museum is a woman. Okay, and my boss, beginning January, the provost is a woman, and I'm thinking, thirty years ago, fifty years ago, it would be inconceivable that your architect would be female, or that the head of a museum would be female, and I'm thinking, that means we were we were told ourselves as a civilization that we were satisfied with only half the brain power available to us. And that's a travesty. That's all I'm saying right now. So but extend this to the rest of the developing world where you have brain power that is worrying about where its next meal is coming from or whether the, 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 the water supply in the well isn't uh, infested we have other human beings where that's their biggest worry today. That's a travesty. That's a, it's a shame on civilization, given how far we are and given that it's the 21st century. So now you got me angry. Ask me something to make me happy. And then, I will. I will. Okay. Ask me, what's my favorite movie? Yeah, give me a <laughs> Okay, go. What, what else you got? Okay. okay, so uh, we have several questions here, especially questions that some of your, uh, some of your readers or some of your followers have asked you in, in the book, like Abeta Ramos asked uh, about 
uh, what are we going to do different when we go to Mars? And Atula Jijan Erkan asked about uh, how we will be able to recognize extraterrestrial life. And I can say to them, yes, he can answer about it, but you can also read his in his book. <laughs> so okay, now, so but I like the uh, how would we recognize extra? I like that one. Um, okay. So um, we look across the universe, and stars on the other side of the universe are made of the same material as our star. Believe it or not, we have tools to arrive at those conclusions. And because we look at the light that comes from the star, and we can analyze the light for what is making the light. So there's certain fundamental things that are true on Earth that are true across the universe and through time. Because as you look out in space, you're looking back in time. That leaves me with enough confidence to say, if we find extraterrestrial life, it will probably be made of atoms. Atoms that we have collected and put on the periodic table of elements. That chart has every element that occurs in nature. We have not found any elements in nature across the universe that we have not a slot uh, allocated on the periodic table. You remember this from your chemistry class, that mysterious chart of boxes that sat in the front of the room every day. So it'll probably be made of atoms. And if it's made of atoms, it means you can see it. You can touch it. So I think... Uh, extraterrestrial life will be very clearly manifested. Uh, it will look unlike anything we've seen on Earth. So that would make it particularly a curious form of life. And to you, that's if you're still curious. It'll definitely be curious to kids. And so I'm not worried that you wouldn't be able to detect it. You might wonder what features it has as a living thing. What senses does it have? Can it see the way we do? It could be asking of us, do we have one of the senses that they do? And maybe we don't have that sense, okay? We all know many people who could use a little more sense in the world, <laughs> as the saying goes, but uh, they might have a different array of senses. They could be very fun to compare and contrast the um, what they are as life relative to what we are as life. So I have no hesitation about whether we would identify. Will it be some glowing uh, energy field? I don't, maybe, I don't know, but that's not where my first bet is gonna be placed. Sure, so we have two more questions. Uh, one, in your TV show, Cosmos, showcase the complex world and the universe we live in. Within the cosmic perspective narrative, it seems that there is always a message of hope, highlighting solutions that are readily available or in the horizon through innovation and research. For you, Neil, what is the role of hope in science communication, especially in, this, in these times of pandemic? Thank you for recognizing that important feature of Cosmos as sort of a, a documentary franchise. There's been three cosmoses. Is that the plural of cosmos? Cosmoses, three cosmoses, uh, 1980 with Carl Sagan. And I, I've had the privilege and honor to host Cosmos in 2014 and most recently 2020. And uh, what's interesting, this is an aside, um, depending on the country, they dis the local, the local, um, uh, media people decide whether they will just have subtitles in the language of the country or whether they will dub my voice with a, a voice actor or vo some voice talent. And I said, well, what's the difference between the two? And they said, there are some cultures where the television is just always on while you're cooking, while you're cleaning. Well, and so people aren't always looking. And so in that, the subtitles wouldn't help. And so Mexico is a place where the TV is a, just a, a constant presence. So in Mexico, there's some Spanish speaking voice that is my voice. Um, in other places where people do focus, 
they instead resort to subtitles. So I just found that an interesting little fact when Cosmos goes to other countries. And it's in like 180 uh, countries in 47 languages. So I'm very proud to be a part of that effort. Uh, a lot of creative people involved. Um, Anne Druyan is the, the, pr the principal writer of this, of all three Cosmoses spanning now 40 years. Um, each Cosmos, what distinguishes them is, yes, we highlight a problem that we face and we offer hope for some kind of solution. Because otherwise we would just say, oh, we're all gonna die, give up now. That's not very productive, okay? You know, you, wanna, you want people to be able to mobilize and take action. So Cosmos is not preachy. It's not trying to hit you over the head. It's, it, it's simply offering you stories. By the way, we go back in time to periods in throughout time and throughout cultures. In 2014, we, we highlighted um, Ibn al-Haytham, who was a, 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 a Muslim scholar in the period of the golden age of Islam. This is a thousand years ago where all manner of science came out of this highly fertile period of time, about, about 300 years, okay? And it's like, well, what was going on then? Let, let's try to duplicate that. And we, what we learn is that these fertile periods are not forever. They somehow rise and then they fall and they show up somewhere else in another country, in another time. And it's some combination of curiosity, um, uh, wisdom, uh, leadership, uh, uh, longing that you want to live a better tomorrow than you live today. I think all of that, that recipe has to all sort of come together. And that's what has held back some countries and propelled others on this landscape. So um, personally, however, I don't like the word hope personally, uh, because hope, I, I put hope together with the word prayer, okay? In fact, there's the Frank, that, uh, we're, we're doing this on hope and prayer. You know, they sometimes they show up together in the same sentence. I put them together for the following reason. When you have hope or when you pray, often, I would say most cases, that you doing either, you have admitted that you have no control over the outcome. Think about it. Say, oh, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. If you could turn a switch guaranteeing it won't rain tomorrow, you're not hoping it doesn't rain. You're turning the switch, okay? You, you, so when you realize you're not in control, you start hoping, you start praying. And I don't want to be that much not in control of what I want to have happen. To resort to saying, I hope, and go back to, you know, sitting on the couch. No, what I want to say is, I can see a future. And I can chart a path. Yes, it's a scientific path, but it's also a political path. It's a social path, a cultural path. I know people have navigated this before. Maybe I can learn something from history. And I know what my society and my culture, and I, I know what works for us. But forgive me for noticing, but in the two-minute video, um, every 30 seconds ago, you were showing somebody dancing, okay? So that tells me dancing is kind of a thing, okay? <laughs> all people, all ages and, and sizes of people dancing. So that's a cultural observation. Maybe this, you know, look in your culture and see how you can bring this together. Act upon this. Don't hope for it. Make it happen. You are not without the power. You're not without the resources. And if you get enough people agreeing, we all want to make this happen as well. Then nobody has to do any hoping. It, you, you spend the energy you'd otherwise spend hoping, you'd spend that doing. 
that's my personal uh, critique of the word hope. And I, I don't hope I don't hope. <laughs> I hope I don't squash people's who, who might cherish that word. You see, I hope it there because I don't control that. See, so I think I'm using hope in my own correct way. I hope I didn't offend anyone. I don't control whether I do, but that's just how I feel about that word. Great, great. Uh, so, I had a question for you, but actually one of our viewers has a really great question. Uh, let me just put it to context. Brazil has a long history of scientific production, especially in the fields of engineering, aeronautics and biodiversity studies and uh, we sort of think how uh, the import about the importance of encouraging science technology engineering and mathematics education for uh, for young people in a developing country like brazil and bia one of our viewers uh said that i would like to thank mr tyson for keeping cosmos alive uh can you say and uh, what can you say to new generations to encourage them uh, to value science? And please tell my son, his name is Bigui, to study. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So uh, how do you pronounce his name again? Bigui. Bigui? Study. Study. Okay. No. <laughs> but I'm not just going to tell him everybody. Okay. Let me, um, let me not say the word study because study implies a chore, time to study. Uh, let me, let's replace that word with learn. Learn. Everyone likes to learn. I learned something new today. I've never met anyone who said, I don't want to learn anything. I'm stopped. I'm, and, no, I've never heard that. But I've heard people say, I don't want to study. You know, but so let's say, let's, if you're going to give a command, let it be learn, learn today. So now, uh, so now I, for, I forgot the question. It was, um, uh, what, uh, what can you say to new oh, the, the next generation to encourage them to value science? Yeah. So, um, I pick up on part of an answer I gave earlier. You, um, you can try to get people to do that. Uh, what I'd like to do is tell them the consequences of not valuing science. Okay? Just try that. So, for example, look 50 years ago, 100 years ago, at the infant mortality rate in Brazil. Okay? And that has gone down. It's still a problem in some districts. But your child might have died in another era were it not for the advances of science. In another era, I'd be someone's slave, okay? Uh, were it not for sort of cultural advances, social advances. So the progress of civilization is really important to, to embracing all that we can. And science, you know what's good about science? The value of pi, and I'm not talking about what the cost of pi is in a restaurant. I'm talking about the value of pi in mathematics is the same everywhere in the world. And it doesn't matter who you worship or who you make love with or what your skin color is. Equations of math and the objective discoveries of science don't care about all the things that otherwise divide us. You realize that the three top things that humans do that crosses civilization, that crosses national borders. One of them is, of course, the World Cup. That's fun. Okay, it can get a little violent if your team doesn't win, but still it's countries coming together. Uh, the Olympics is another thing, all right? Uh, but that's still your contesting countries. Oh, war, world war. Yeah, you're, you're contesting countries to the point of death. All right, but there's one more there. Science collaborations. Science. It's the International Space Station. Science. Do you know the particle accelerator in Switzerland? At the center for the European Nuclear Research, CERN, it's called, where they discovered the new particles? The Higgs boson, it's called? Look at the number of countries involved in that. 
scientists know how to disagree, find better evidence, resolve the disagreement, and still go out for a beer afterwards with each other. Okay? So you want, you want to know what might save the world and have the world become one? It's when we share the same scientific goals and collaborate, knowing that the differences in language, culture, and everything else evaporate in the laboratory. And so uh, in terms of getting the next generation excited, I'd give a different answer if you were a truly developing country, okay? You're not really a developing, no, I'm not buying that. You know, how, you know how I know you're not a developing country? Because I'm flying in airplanes that you designed and built, okay? Actual developing nations don't have aerospace industries, okay? Can we get that straight here, please, okay? I f one third of the time I'm flying between American cities, I'm on an Embraer aircraft, okay? Designed, built, engineered, sorry to be putting my face in the camera, engineered in Brazil, okay? The same place that everybody's shaking their, their, their okay? And, and on the beach and in the Mardi Gras, you guys built an airplane that I fly in the United States of America, okay? So, no, you're not a developing nation. So my message to you, because you're not a developing nation, because you already have industry, is let more Brazilians and more people of the world know about that industry. Let people know, because then you have a reference point. You can say, oh my gosh, that's my country. Oh, then, then the, a point of pride. Not pride where you denigrate others, but just pride of place and pride of origin. Nothing wrong with that. And you can say, let's do that again. Let's be pioneers once more. I can't tell that to, to Ethiopia. I can't say, you know, let's have aerospace like you once did. No, I can't say that. Those different messages, if people are still trying to get their stuff going, okay? But I can tell Brazil this. And so, yeah, I'm sorry I'm screaming at you and sticking my face on the camera. But these are the questions. <laughs> no, no worries. Uh, the thing is that you you wrote a letter to Brazil. What are, what will be like here ending our chat? What will be your message uh, to Brazilians that are listening to us right now? Yeah, everything I have to say to you. I, I hate to to send you to another place, but I put a lot of energy and emotion and and brain in my letter to Brazil. It's on the internet. Uh, in fact, it's on my website. You can go in Portuguese. Of course, it's there. In, in Port if it's a letter to Brazil, it's got to be in Portuguese as well. So English and Portuguese, right? Okay. Um, and so um, it's just trying. It's, it's a wake-up call. That's what it is. I, I, I tell you why I know you exist. And, yeah, it's for some obvious thing. I know about the Mardi Gras. Yeah. I know about your coffee. I know about your, your, your football team. The world knows these things. But does the world know you build aer airplanes? Does the world know you had one of the pioneering aviators at the birth of aviation 100 years ago? Does the world know that? Do you know that? I, I don't know. Uh, and by the way, uh, maybe somebody should talk to Embraer, whoever else is building the planes today. Tell them to put on the side of the airplane, proudly engineered in Brazil. That'll blow people's minds. Because we all have Brazil, Brazil bias, right? Beautiful beaches on... <laughs> it's, a, it's a Brazil bias, okay? Okay, you got Jesus up on the thing. You got the sugar... You got all the, the Brazil tourist book. We, we know that. We got that. Time to get your engineering mojo back in place. Yes. Mojo, I, does that translate to Portuguese? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's here for the translator to do this stuff. Yeah, yeah, so translator, get that word right. Okay. <laughs> mojo. And by the way, Embraer is doing the project for the flying car as well. So hopefully we'll be flying cars made engineered in Brazil. Excellent. Let's, let's hope for that. So, so that's my message to all of Brazil and all of uh, the people there. And 
Uh, no, I mean, I, it, was a, it was an honor to be asked. to That, I, that book didn't have the letter in it. That just some, someone uh, felt strongly that that occasion, um, that a letter belonged there at the front of the book to the, the, the Portuguese uh, native speaking audience of Brazil. And so uh, there it is. Now I confess I wrote it in English and then it was translated. I, I'm not fluent in, uh, uh, forgive me. I know, I know two languages, English and then a programming language for computers. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> so I'm, I'm bilingual in that sense. I'll be ready when the robots take over. I'll be talking to the robots, okay. <laughs> And hopefully the kids now can learn also programming because I think that that will just accelerate innovation, you know, yes. in a rate. So hopefully yes. everybody will be uh, bilingual, trilingual, come. Let, exactly. The more the better. The more the better. Mr. Tyson, thank you. Thank you very much for talking. It was a pleasure speaking uh, with you about the cosmic and earthly perspectives as yes. well. So thank you. Thank and you. I would like also to thank uh, Record Publishing Group, which is our partner here in this event, and for the translators, uh, Paula and Artur from Fox uh, uh, Translators, and also our uh, sign language uh, translators, uh, Igor and Stephanie. And to our visitors and followers who have prepared special programming uh, to help you have more access to culture and science right from your home or at our museum. Take a moment to subscribe to our channel, Museum of Tomorrow, here on YouTube. The Museum of Tomorrow is a cultural institution of the Municipal Secret Secretariat of Culture of the city of Rio de Janeiro, managed by the Institute of, for Development and Management. All of our projects, programming and activities during pandemic times or otherwise are only possible thanks to our strong network of supporters patrons and partners, including Santander, Shell, IBM, NG, Lojas Americanas, Global Group, and Fundação Roberto Marinho. Thank you all who are watching us at home. Have a good weekend. Thanks again, Mr. Tyson. Until next time. Thank you.